So for those of you that are new this morning, my name is Terry Lee. I'm one of the pastors here. And today we are in the second to last week of a sermon series that we're calling Stories. Uh, so January of this year, we began in the book of Genesis. We started with creation. And next week, we will be ending in the last chapter of the Bible. And so over the course of five months, we've selected kind of 20 of the biggest stories that we feel like has shaped the Christian faith, has kind of shaped the way that we view the Bible, the way we think about God, the way we view our salvation, the way that we have a relationship with God through Christ. We've taken those stories and we've just kind of looked at them over the series of months that we've had together. And as you know, we'll be in the book of Acts today. And so what we see in the book of Acts is the New Testament church just kind of figuring things out as they're led by the Holy Spirit, as they're being uh, on mission together, that God is forming what he uses to reach the world and also to build this community of Christ followers. And what we'll see this morning is that there is a little friction in the church. Uh, if you think about our human bodies, you probably know that uh, the greatest threats to our bodies are not something that happens externally, right? It's not heat, it's not cold, it's not, it's not these extremes that can happen, it's not the dangers that are presented whenever you get in your car today. Those are not the greatest threats to your health. No, the greatest threats are the small things, like when your heart skips a beat and could possibly malfunction. It's whenever there's a, a blood clot, it's where there's an illness that begins to grow inside of you. Those things internally pose the greatest threat to our bodies. And what we'll see today in Acts 15 is that it was the same with the body of Christ. What was going on internally posed the greatest threat to halting the mission of God. It was people, it was brothers and sisters, it was the family of God that began to, to not see eye to eye, to actually argue among one another. And so I want you to look in Acts 15 with me. We're going to read the first 21 verses together, and then we're just going to kind of dissect this passage. Chapter 15, verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them to order them to keep the law of Moses. So let me summarize these first five verses really quick, and then we'll continue. There is a, a church in Antioch that Paul and Barnabas are a part of, and these men from Judea have come in, and they've said, uh, you don't just need to believe in Christ to become a Christian and to be saved. You actually need to trust in Christ, and then also you need to begin practicing these Jewish laws and rituals. You need to be circumcised. You need to do these things in order to really be right with God. And so Paul and Barnabas, they have this debate uh, with them. And they say this issue is much bigger than the church at Antioch. So then they go to Jerusalem so that they can kind of have a, a wider debate with the church at large and say let's settle this issue about what it takes to be right with God together. So verse 6, they get to Jerusalem. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? 
But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogue. All right, there is a lot going on in this passage, and maybe you read through Acts 15 as you're going through our Bible reading plan as a church, and you're just kind of like, I don't really know what all is going on here. Well, here is the great thing. At the heart of this chapter, of this passage, the question rings out, what is the gospel? That's what this chapter is about. People are trying to figure out what is the the gospel. And if you're here this morning, the way that that question is answered matters for you. Let's say you're a Christian here this morning, and you come to this passage, and you're trying to figure out, okay, how, how does this make sense? How do, I, how do I work through a text like this? It's to understand that every single day as a Christian, you fight to understand the gospel. And you are on the verge of of misunderstanding it. You're tempted to put your own work in the place of God's. You're tempted to say, I believe that Christ is enough, but in order to really have a right relationship with God, uh, I need to make sure that I'm checking off these religious boxes. Right? That's extremely dangerous when we see that faith comes in Christ alone by God's grace. Let's say you're not a Christian this morning, or, or maybe you're trying to figure out where you stand with your faith, you're kind of peeking over the fence of Christianity, and just trying to understand, like, what is it that I really would believe, even if I was to be a Christian? It is the gospel. And there are, I have no doubt there are people in this room, for sure in our city, who have said, you know what, I've tried the church stuff. I, I feel like I've heard the gospel before. I kind of, you know, I, I tried to live my life in that way, but it didn't work. Could it be that if that is your story, if you walked away from the church because you were burnt by church, that what you believed or what you heard was something that was similar to the gospel? Maybe a watered-down version or a counterfeit of the gospel. So the way that we define the gospel is just as important today as it would have been for this church in 50 AD, which is why we need to devote ourselves to understanding Something like this. As I was studying this this week, I was just like, where has Acts 15 been my whole life? Like, this is such a fun passage to study. So, here's what I want you to understand as, as we walk through this that the gospel is the good news that Jesus has accomplished perfect obedience in our place. He has accomplished obedience perfectly in every area of the law. Every part of God's word that obedience is commanded, Jesus was perfectly obedient in a way that we can't be. Not only that, that he satisfied God's wrath on the cross. So when you sin against God and you're tempted to say, I can atone somehow, I can do enough good things, I can attend MC this week to kind of get God off my back, I can feel a little less guilty if I spend an hour in prayer, then what you don't understand is that the wrath of God against you, if you're a Christian, was fully satisfied on the cross. Not halfway satisfied by Jesus on the cross and then kind of finished up by your good work throughout the week. And third, his resurrection, Jesus was resurrected to prove 
He is the author and giver of life. That is not your role to fill. That was completely filled by Christ in his death and in his resurrection. Now, I, I think we can hear something like this and, and we struggle, right? Because we look at verse 1 and, and see that some men came down from Judea and they were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 5, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and order them to keep the law of Moses. So, so we see these things and, and we say, was it not good to keep the law of Moses? Like, should we just kind of throw out things like don't commit murder or don't commit adultery or do not lie or do not serve other gods? These are all things that were in the law of Moses. So is the Bible teaching we just throw those things out? No, what, what Scripture is teaching and what we're going to hear Peter, James, Paul, and Barnabas argue for here is that good works are not preparation for your salvation. Good works are proof of your salvation. These good works are not prepping you for, oh, now you can be right with God. Rather, these are evidences of it. And it's important that we get these things right, that our salvation, our relationship with God, our understanding of grace comes before we realize that we were created to walk in these good works. I was thinking about the importance of order this past week. Uh, I wrote my mother-in-law a Mother's Day card and and we spent some time with, uh, with Abby's parents this week, so I gave her this card. And I thought that I just began it beautifully, you know. My first sentence was just on point. I was like, son-in-law of the year. And, uh, and so, well, she, she begins reading the card, and she has a funny look on her face. And I was like, well, what is up with this? And then she goes, oh, I misread this first sentence in your card. And I began thinking through it. And she said, I thought... But it said that I'm the second best mom in the world. And she was like, I was kind of hoping I would have been first. And I was like, no, no, no. What I wrote is you're the best second mom in the world. Because my, my biological mom is my first mom. And you're my second mom. And she was like, I was really offended at first. You just thought I was like second best. I'm like, runner up mom. Just don't put that in the card if you think it's true. you know. And I was like, order matters so much significantly more in Christianity, right? Uh, do we think, like, oh, I've got to do all this, i got to check these boxes, i got to make sure I'm baptized, i got to make sure that, you know, my kids are watching Veggie Tales. i got to make sure that I'm a young life leader, i gotta, I got to check these boxes. God, am I good enough? Some of you are struggling with that this morning. You, you laid in bed last night wondering, God, am I good enough? Are we, are we okay? that question plagues you, then, then hopefully the gospel will be a great comfort to you. The, the, the truths that Peter, Paul, and James present here is, is not one of check these boxes, but Christ has checked all these boxes. Trust in him. Place your faith in him. Tim Keller, uh, a Presbyterian guy that I just love to read, says this, while every other religion operates on some type of performance-related principle, I obey, therefore I am accepted, the gospel condemns any self-righteousness and assures us of Christ's righteousness. I am accepted through Christ, therefore I obey. You see how that's different? You see how Christianity is so different from the religions of the world? Not I obey, therefore I am accepted, but I am accepted, therefore is a great joy to obey. Now what I want to do here is just kind of walk through these 21 verses and then look at four possible symptoms of what will happen to us, to our church, and to the church at large when we misunderstand the gospel. Uh, because I think it can be really dangerous for us to misunderstand. So my first point this morning is this, that the gospel is only good news if you get it right. The gospel is the greatest news in the world. Literally, gospel means good news. It, it was a word that came from whenever someone won a victory far off in battle, and they would run to the city, and they would proclaim victory, and that was the gospel. So whenever Christians heard the good news that Jesus alone saves and life could be found in him, they say, let's use that word. 
right? Victory has been won for us. But the gospel is only good news if you get it right. Now that's what was going on here, is, is these guys who were Judaizers came in to the church at Antioch and they said, hey, we believe that Jesus is really, really important. You need to trust in Jesus. But in addition to Jesus, to be right with God, you need to do these things. Right? The, the name of these guys were Judaizers, are also known as the circumcision party. All right? Now, church growth is hard enough as it is, but if the name of your denomination is the circumcision party, I can't imagine your members class is going to be very cool. Right? <laughs> it's like going to be all women and children because no 30-year-old guy wants to go to that church. So this presents obvious problems. And so we see in verse 2 that there's, there's this debate going on, and Paul and Barnabas are saying, you guys have got the gospel wrong. So they said, we're going to go to our mother church in Jerusalem. This is kind of where the movement of Christianity started. And so we're going to gather the apostles and the elders, and we're going to talk about what's going on here. So we see that Paul and Barnabas leave. Uh, they take some other guys with them. Verse 3 tells us that they go through Phoenicia and Samaria, other Gentile places. People without a Jewish background are there. They're believing the gospel. They're being discipled. They're growing in their faith. Uh, this would have been the time period, most likely, that the book of Galatians was written. So if you're trying to figure out, I wonder what Paul was saying to those guys. Go read the book of Galatians. Read it this afternoon. It's a great way to understand how he would have argued holding this tension of the law, but also understanding it's by grace alone. So um, that's something I would really encourage you to do. And then we see that they get to Jerusalem, and people are fired up that they're there, right? They're like, oh, great, Paul and Barnabas, they're back. Everybody's celebrating. And then there's this group of people in verse 5 that says the Pharisees, who were believers, said they need to be circumcised to keep the law of Moses. Now, I don't know about you, but for me this week, as I was reading this, I feel like I've always viewed the Pharisees as the religious guys who were kind of outside of Christianity, who were pointing to the Christians and saying, hey, you need to keep the law. You need to become more religious. But what we see here is that these guys were believers. These are people in the church. It's not just non-Christians that have the tendency to add to the gospel. We see here that it's Christians who have the tendency to try to add to the gospel, to try to make tears within Christianity where we separate kind of JV Christians from varsity Christians, people who have a worse past with people who just kind of grew up in church or whatever it is. We see how dangerous this is. I think it could possibly be easy, and we run the risk of, of thinking, how could, these, how could these Jewish believers here struggle so much with this concept of free grace to people without a Jewish background? How could they struggle so much? Does that seem harsh? Does that seem unfair? And, and God just kind of gave me a great picture of this this week. Um, many of you know that me and Abby, we traveled to North Carolina this past week to watch my sister-in-law graduate. And uh, as we were, you know, trying to get ready, we get to the airport, Aaron drops us off at the airport, and it's me, Abby, and our 11-month-old son, okay? And so traveling with an 11-month-old is just a completely different adventure, right? You've got a stroller, you've got a car seat, you've got a diaper bag, you've got toys, just whatever it takes to get through an hour and 10 minute flight. And so we finally, you know, we get to the ticket counter, we check our bags, we you know, are just kind of making our way up to the security line. And when we, we get to the security line, we see that there are at least 100 people in front of us. Um, it was uncharacteristically long for the Cincinnati airport to have that many people ahead of us. And we we're just dreading it. You know, we're like, we're about to have to try to inch all this stuff forward for the next hour. And we kind of block eyes with a flight, uh, with a TSA agent on our way uh, into this security line. And we see her lift one of the ropes. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. You know, like, this is God's grace right here. And so she lifts this rope and, and, and kind of waves us in. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So we divert the stroller, you know. Um, and we're, we begin going into this line. And, and to our surprise, we totally bypass like five rows of just people. And like 
like 30 people in each row, and we just walk straight up to the TSA agent. He looks at our IDs, he looks at our boarding pass, and he lets us straight into security. And I was like, why did we just get to do that? You know, we didn't pay extra. We didn't do pre-check. We got there way later than everybody else in the line. It did not make sense. And I could feel the heat from the stairs in every person that was over here. And I turned to Abby and I said, this was the problem in Acts 15. This was the problem. It wasn't that all those people weren't glad that, that we, you know, oh, there's people up here, I'm glad they're getting through, you know, I think this is great. The problem was they felt it was so unfair that these people didn't wait as long as we did. They didn't get to the airport the same time that we did. They're not having to inch all their luggage one person at a time as each person gets through. It's just not fair. And what a perfect picture of the gospel that, that Jesus sees us in, in no deserving state and lifts the rope and says, come on in. These people are getting in too. But you're welcome in as well. That is grace. And there's even a tendency among some of us who have been Christians for a long time to, to hear about a person who trusts in Christ really late in life, perhaps on their deathbed, and think, you're telling me they just lived however they wanted for 50, 70 years, and then God just let them in and just forgave all their sin? If that bothers you, first off, you're, you're close to understanding how grace works. But, but two, maybe, maybe we're missing it. Maybe we're missing the joy that should come from realizing that we are those that are just as undeserving as they. This is also good news for anybody in here who's currently struggling with sin, that God's grace is enough. And it's not based upon these works, because if it is your works that can save you, then it has to be your works that can keep you. And it's also your works that could lose you. But if it's completely dependent upon Christ, then it is not dependent upon you at all. And so this message was extremely important for them to get across. So they get to Jerusalem, verse 6. We see that Peter is the first one to stand up. It says, after there was much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. What was required for them to be saved? Hearing and believing. That was it. It was the only two things that welcomed the Gentiles into the kingdom of God. But if you read uh, in Acts 10, you see that God had done several things in the past of Peter so that his heart would be prepared to, as a, as a Jewish man to go to preach the gospel to Gentiles. We see that while he's in a city called Joppa, there's only one guy that will give him a place to stay that night, and he's a guy that is a leather worker for a Jewish guy who can't be around or under the roof of any type of dead animal carcass to see him receiving hospitality from someone who is a Gentile who worked with dead animals. And, and this is already God kind of breaking down some of these stereotypes that Peter has. So uh, it's just really, really amazing how we see even God preparing his heart for this. And then he stands up. He says, God made a choice that they would hear. And verse 8, God who knows their heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. So how are you welcomed in? Your heart is cleansed by faith. What does it take for me to be right with God? What does it take for me to be welcomed in the family of God, to have my heart cleansed by faith in the finished work of Christ? And after Peter explains this, the whole assembly falls silent, it says. They can't believe this. Uh, this. This was such a powerful argument that Peter is speaking as an eyewitness to people being saved, people being changed forever by the gospel. 
that Paul and Barnabas stand up and say, hey, here's what's been going on in our ministry. This is how people have been coming to Christ as a result of our ministry. They tell stories just like the ones that we've heard every Sunday morning from our church members. They're talking about the way that God has continually called people out of darkness into light. And then after they get done talking, James steps up. Now, I'm sure that the Pharisees in the crowd were kind of thinking, okay, finally someone who's going to speak from our team, right? Because even Josephus, a, a historian who wrote way later, who he would say, man, whenever it came to the Jewish law, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he was flawless in keeping it. So what would James say? James would stand up and he would say, Brothers, everything that Peter has said, here he refers to him as Simeon, Simon Peter, everything that Peter says here, it's right on. It's correct. In fact, he points to Scripture and he says, Isaiah, Amos, and Jeremiah all looked forward to the day that this would happen. And those without a Jewish background, those that were historically not the people of God, would be welcomed in, and they would rebuild the broken house of David. Because Jesus would reign as king over their hearts from the lineage of David. It was an amazing thing. Then he gives some advice that, that we'll look at here in just a moment. But I want to draw out four things. Here are four symptoms of a misunderstood gospel. Right? I think that, that we can ask ourselves if, if it's... A sign of internal health in the church that the gospel is understood, then how do we know when the gospel is being misunderstood? First, I believe that the gospel is misunderstood when Jesus isn't enough. We misunderstand the gospel whenever we, we don't believe that Jesus is enough, and that's exactly what was happening here. John MacArthur uses this illustration. He says, I want you to imagine... Uh, that someone gives you a beautiful Rembrandt painting. You know, it's just uh, unbelievable. The colors are vibrant. It, it's, it just seems laid out beautifully. There's this depth of field that almost, you know, just seems to come off the canvas. And so yeah, they give it to you, and, and you've got it in your living room, and you say, you know what? I think I can, I think I can fix this a little bit. So you pull out some colored pencils and you just begin shading around the edge. Not much, just a couple inches. And then you hang it up on the wall and, and you have a, a bunch of guests come over for dinner and, and you point at that painting and you say, hey, look what I created. Isn't this beautiful? Isn't this wonderful? Aren't these colors magnificent? They say, wow, you did all that? Absolutely, yeah, this is, this is my work. And as absurd as that sounds, it's something we would never do. We often do that with our Christianity. We say, I put my faith in Christ and his work is perfect and, and he is all I need and my relationship with God is completely dependent upon him. But, but look at how much scripture I've memorized. Look at how much I serve in church. Look at how faithful I am. Look at my work just kind of slapped on to his. Doesn't that make me feel great? Well, many of us wouldn't want to admit we do that. We so often do. How many of us are constantly making Jesus the hero in our lives? Or are we prone to point our fingers back at ourselves? Jesus is certainly enough. Second, we see the unhealthy division that takes place in the church. What happened here is cultural values were elevated over the gospel. Traditions were elevated over the gospel. Things that were preferential were elevated over the gospel. And whenever that happened, a harmful and unhealthy division took place in the church. This is something that we need to remember. If our music style unites us as a church, then we can be divided. If our age range unites us as a church, then we can be divided. If homeschool or public school unites us, then we can be divided. If our skin color unites us, then we can be divided. If where you live or your economic level unites us, then we can be divided. But if the gospel unites us, then we will not be divided. The gospel is key. We make the main things the main things here. We 
major and the majors here, not in the minors. And the gospel is a major. And that is the only way that our church will not be divided. Third, self-righteousness replaces salvation by faith. Salvation comes by, by trusting Christ, not by our own self-righteousness, not by our own works. Yeah, what they were saying here is we can do enough to be right with God. It ultimately comes down to what we do. Our performance matters more than the performance of Christ. But we know that the law was only sufficient to show where we are sinful. I mean, let's just say that um, you're a terrible cook, right? Okay, so I mean, I'm sure most of you can't relate, but you just can't cook anything, right? And so somebody gives you a recipe book. Now, that doesn't change your ability to cook or not. It just kind of shows you, wow, these people, the standard for cooking is actually much higher than I thought it was. You know, I, I was kind of expecting three steps, and there's like 20 on here. Okay, the standard is actually much higher than I thought it was. If you're chronically late and somebody gives you a watch for your birthday, it doesn't mean, oh, now I'm just on time everywhere. No, now it shows that instead of just thinking you're five minutes late, you're actually like 12 minutes late everywhere you go. It doesn't fix you. It just kind of broadcasts how broken you are. Well, when the law comes, when the law is given to God's people, they're not like, oh, good, we'll, we'll just do this. We'll perfectly do this and everything. We'll, we can handle this. No, what... What it does is it showed them how much they needed a substitute to obey in their place and give him their spirit that they could obey. That's what they needed. And fourthly, we see that there is a greater commitment to personal comfort than the great commission when we misunderstand the gospel. This is dangerous. There's a greater commitment to our personal comfort than the great commission when we misunderstand the gospel. Do we ever create obstacles to the gospel for people that are unnecessary? Maybe even unintentional. Do we make someone feel like if they're to really be welcome at the Oaks Church that they need to be able to quote John Piper Right? Or that they need to have read this systematic theology book. Or that they should listen to sermons by these people. Or that they should have been a young life leader at some point. Or at least been in young life. Do we alienate people, even accidentally, if they can't keep up with our language? Does a first time guest to one of our MCs or to a Sunday gathering feel odd because they don't exactly know how to fit into Christian conversation? Or are we constantly asking ourselves, is this something that could be an obstacle to someone? Is this something that I should just possibly give up or, or not make a main issue in order to be more loving to someone? The gospel is offensive enough. We don't need to be, Right? We, we want to do the best we can to welcome people, to make people feel loved here, because we know at some point during the hour that we're together, I'm going to get up here and say, we're all sinners, none of us are good enough for God, and the only way that you can be saved is for the Son of God to die in your place and to be resurrected. Unless you believe in Him, you will go to hell, but if you do believe in Him, you'll have life forever. Right? That, that's an offensive message to some people. And if the gospel can be offensive, then we want to do whatever we can to not be. And then oftentimes that means putting the Great Commission before our own personal comfort. What we see here is that the gospel is simple. What they would continue to do here throughout the book of Acts, and specifically in chapter 15, is they would, they would take... And they would, they would get together and they would write a letter that would be sent out to the churches. And Paul and Barnabas, with a couple other guys from the team, they would take these letters and, and they would disperse them around the church. And they would come to the conclusion that the gospel is simple and is based upon grace. What is the gospel? It is simple. 
the gospel is simply Jesus in my place. What is it based upon? It is based upon the grace of God, not your own doing. And this is the only way that they could have life together. So how do we understand what James talks about here in these last couple of verses, 19 through 21? We'll look at this together. James says, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So James says, hey, you're completely saved by grace, through faith. Your obedience is not what keeps you right with God, but here are four things that I want you to do. That's what he says to the Gentiles. He says, I don't want you to do anything that could seem like sexual immorality, right? So, so even if, you know, there's like a co-worker that you just want to grab lunch with and you feel like if you guys are out at a restaurant together that someone could walk in and say like, why is he hanging out with her? That's not his wife. Like, if there's anything that just even feels like possibly could be recognized as sexual immorality, just stay away from that. And also, if, if anything has been strangled, or if anything is cooked in blood, you know, like, like a medium rare steak, uh, or anything that's been sacrificed to an idol, don't eat those things. Gentiles, don't eat those things around your Jewish brothers. And we're like, well, why would he tell them to do all this stuff? I thought he just said that you don't have to be you don't have to keep all these laws in order to, you know, be right with God. No, what he's doing here is he's saying, I don't want you to become a stumbling block to your other brothers. So this thing that is not a sin, it's not a sin to eat food that was once sacrificed to an idol. But in order that it doesn't break fellowship, in order that it doesn't create disunity, in order that it doesn't hurt a brother or sister, just give it up. Just give it up when you're around them. There are things that are not sinful for us to do that we need to give up on occasion in the presence of certain people so that we do not become a stumbling block to them. Now, I have the tricky choice here to keep going and just say, you guys figure out what that means for yourself, or I can get to your personal lives and, and make some people mad. So, we'll go for it. I'm wrapping up anyways, right? <laughs> so, let me ask you some questions. Should we abstain from alcohol in certain settings because it can harm another person that is currently struggling with alcohol abuse? Is it okay for a Christian to watch R-rated movies? What kind of music do you listen to around the people that you're hanging out with? When you post politically charged messages to Facebook exercising your First Amendment, could it possibly harm the person that you will be singing next to on a Sunday morning? Unity around Christ's atonement is more important than your view on the Second Amendment. When you're choosing an outfit to wear, are you more concerned about how it makes you feel or how it could possibly cause a brother or sister to stumble in the church? Is it wise to have lunch with a co-worker of the opposite sex by himself or herself and a fellow church member could walk in and view it as something more? These are things that are a matter of conscience. And none of the things that I just mentioned are sinful at all. But... I do think that it would be wise, as James asks the church here, if there is something that could cause somebody to stumble, just, just give it up for that moment. Give it up in that time period, because fellowship around the gospel is more important than you exercising your Christian liberty. Our love in Christ limits our liberties. It doesn't make us exercise them all the more. If you're a Christian, your job is is to absorb what could offend you and abstain from what could offend others. Right? If you're a Christian, it is your goal to absorb what offends you. Don't make a big deal out of it. 
and to abstain from what could possibly offend others. Now, I know that we could just take that to like the furthest degree and you could have you know this great deliberation and not feel like you can absolutely do anything. So there's a great flexibility here in the Christian faith, but I do want us to at least be mindful whenever we're trying to figure out when it's a matter of conscience how we should then live we would see that this would not only be an issue in the church of Antioch, in the church of Jerusalem, but also in the church of Corinth. Every week we take communion as a church together. And one of the interesting things about the communion passage, passage that we read every single week is that Paul is writing that passage to a church that has been divided by culture, by socioeconomic level, by a million different things. And so whenever he gives them the command to take communion together, what he is saying is let the gospel unify what has been so broken. And that's what we do every week. We come in here, we take communion at the same time, saying, you know what, things have been different, we're different, we may stand even in different places on certain topics, uh, maybe you're sitting next to a person that is the most Republican person in the room or the most Democratic person in the room. You don't see eye to eye on who you vote for when you get to the polling booth, but you see eye to eye on the gospel. And what communion does is it says we all need the broken body of Christ. We all need the shed blood of Christ. You are my brother. You are my sister. And every time we pass that communion plate to the person next to us, we are silently preaching the gospel and saying, Christ accepts you if you have placed your trust in him. His grace has covered every sin that you have committed this week and will commit this next week. The gospel is sufficient for you. It was the message of Acts 15, and it's the message for the Oaks Church and every church that proclaims the gospel today. Father God, you are gracious to us, uh, even to speak to us through a, a passage like this. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, the things that were said this morning were spoken only to glorify you. Lord, I pray that uh, as we reflect on your word, that you would even reveal the parts of our heart that fail to trust the gospel. Lord, where are we putting our own personal comfort before desiring to reach other people? Where are we placing our trust in ourselves instead of Jesus? Would you bring these things to light in our own heart that we could repent of them and turn to you? Lord, may this time of communion be a time that we're able to reflect upon your grace toward us, realizing that it is in Christ and Christ alone that we are saved.